Uh, well, thank you very much for spending the last time at the conference with me. Uh, horror stories from other people API. You know, this is kind of a controversial title, and I want to set the record straight and share the agenda of what this is going to be about ahead of the time. And normally I will say, so if you don't like it, you can go watch other presentation. That's not going to be the case. I ask the people, the door is locked, you cannot even go away. The signal jump, cannot use your phone, so you're going to have to stick anyway. But we'll start, what this is not about. Uh, first of all, this is not an introduction on API design. It's not the, it's not the right place. Uh, and if you're interested, I'm already sharing my ideas how an API should look like. And you can check the YouTube video if you want. Um, this is not a sales pitch about an API design tool. I work for a bunch of companies. I'm not here to sell anything at all. That's not my intention. Uh, this is not material for short-lived API. If you're having a small startup and you just want to sell the company as soon as possible, cash your check, go on a yacht, that's not the talk for you. Uh, this is more for a long-living API program. Um, and so what we're going to be talking more is, well, first of all, I'm going to give you a small introduction about me and then showing you a bunch of real stories that I've been seeing in the wild while working with other people's API. So we're going to explore some of those, find and show what I think are the problematic part, and then we'll probably propose an alternative, and then we'll repeat and repeat. Um, before we jump into this, uh, I have to do that, unfortunately, but you know, this presentation was prepared by myself, and the opinion expressed are not my employers, future, past, current employees. They have nothing to do with me. This is my personal material, uh, and it's solely for informational purposes. Do not follow this 100% of the time, because without complete context, I cannot really give you specific advice. And I reserve the, the right to change my, I'm not the god of the API, but I reserve my right to change opinion because stuff's changed. And you know, for you it's probably blah, 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 I don't care, whatever it is, I had to do that anyway. So from the legal standpoint, I'm good. Uh, so quick introduction about myself. My name is Vincenzo. Uh, today I work as a senior API manager and mostly as an API architect for Microsoft. Um, uh, in particular, I work on Microsoft Graph, this gigantic API, probably the biggest that I've ever seen so far. And I've been uh, collecting over the course of the years a bunch of titles, you know, Google Developer Expert, Outzero Ambassador. I've been working a lot of years with the API Days Committee. I also was the organizer of the API Days Barcelona in 2019. Um, I'm still in Microsoft MVP, although that, that's actually not accurate anymore. And those are my contacts in case you want to get in touch with me. You know, there's email, there's my website. Um, I actually don't even have Twitter anymore. I got out of it. It's a toxic place, I think. Um, and in terms of the API journey I had so far, so I started in 2014 uh, by working in API, where I was responsible for transforming the API blueprint, which was an API specification uh, type, into an auto-generated documentation that you can explore and scroll and do whatever you wanted to, generating the console, SDK, and the code examples. Then the company was acquired by Oracle. They told what the roadmap was going to look like, and I said, okay, I'm going to quit, goodbye. And I left the company as soon as possible. And then I joined Launch Badger, where I was responsible for the API gateway for this specific platform. It's called Express Gateway. I don't know if, you, if you've been using it around. It has a decent amount of success. Uh, in October 2018, I joined Stoplight, where I was primarily responsible for Prism, uh, the open source uh, mock server for OpenAPI 2, OpenAPI 3, and Postman collection. Now, I don't know, probably you've been using that. It's mostly my work. Um, in January 2021, I started working for Sentinel-1, where I was the lead API architect for the marketplace for external integration. And then in March 2022, again, I, I've been starting to work in Microsoft as an API architect for Microsoft Graph. Um, and I'm gonna give, and then I'll talk about later why I went through, why I thought it was important to specify the experiences that I had. But also, again, I've been speaking in API days and organizing a bunch of conferences, like a lot of them. These are just some of the pictures. And the reason is that I'm bringing this up is, first of all, I wanna make sure that everybody's on the same page that I've been working in almost every part of the stack from building tools for API developers and building APIs and architecting big APIs and whatsoever. So the material you see here, it's not a bunch of stuff that I've been collecting from blog posts or articles. This is stuff that I've been doing. A if you knew all this, but this is not a collection of articles. I've done that. And more importantly, um, 
every time I go and speak on API conferences, I see a lot of, you know, we gotta design the APIs, it's a product, and we pat ourselves on the backs. My experience is, out there, it's a different world. That's not angels. The industry, I don't think it's in such a good shape as, as we think, or maybe I just work with the wrong people every single time. That might be one of the reasons. And so, now let's go through some of the patterns, and the way I've been classifying those is using an irritometer, irritometer level. So how much I get irritated when I see this stuff. And so the first level we're gonna be seeing is the common ground, which hopefully everybody's on the same page. We should agree on the basics. And so, and then we go on the questionable and then philosophical level, what I'm still trying to understand what's the best thing to do. Uh, so the first irritometer level, again, is gonna be the common ground. And if you don't agree with what I'm being, gonna be saying, okay, I guess we, we're gonna be departing uh, because that, there's no conversation that, can we, that we can have. Okay, so first one, security credential. Uh, here's one example that I've seen. Hey, I've created an account for you. Uh, this is the token. Please let me know if you need any assistance. That's one example. Take a look at another one. Let me know when you're gonna be working on the API integration, and this is the, the token you can use. Um, uh, why not, let's see another one. Um, the account has been provisioned, and here's the company, username, and password, and you can see what's the problem here. You know, you're sending the token via email, um, and in, I, I, I should not tell you this, but anyway, in general, don't send, don't send tokens over email. That's usually a good idea. But more importantly, again, we're talking about a long-lived API program, and so, first of all, get out of the delivery business. Do not be in charge of delivering the API keys somehow to the customer. Let the customer grab them from your platform, and then you can figure it out. I'm gonna give you way further, um, get out of the generation business. Like, generating a good API key and permission and whatsoever, that's not an easy job at all. And so if you can, and there are solutions on the market, get out of the generation business instead of trying to save the $3 a month for a platform and using a random crypto thing and just give it to the customer. Um, and, and again, get out of the management business. Uh, if you have a big platform and, and you know one of the API calls is triggering multiple systems and the API key gets revoked in the middle, how do you handle that? Why should you handle that? There are platforms that are already having strategies to mitigate those things. Just use them. Again, if you're doing your API for your little startup, you don't really care. But if you're being an API program, that's something you want to do. And so, if you sum it up all of those together, try to outsource the entire process as much as you can. And so, you know, you can use an API gateway or an app service. Uh, Kong is doing a great job of that. There are alternatives like Tyke, um, OutZero, um, Azure has an API gateway, even though I work for Microsoft, I'd be like, eh, nah, nah. We're not, we're not there yet. Okay, so, so far I'm assuming we agree. You know, that, that's the way it should be. Let's move on with versioning. Uh, this is another kind of a controversial topic, and I'm gonna give you a real example. Uh, so we have, this is coming from a documentation page. You know, we have a management API, version 2.0. This is a bunch of resources that are being exposed, and then, there's the version 2.1. Um, what is the problem that I'm having? And I think a lot of the people are gonna agree. Okay, we have version two and version 2.1, and the only difference is, is, you know, we have alerts and we have the custom detection rules. And the problem is, uh, well, first of all, in general, if you're adding something to a collection, that's not a breaking change. Uh, it's, it's not even a, we, it's arguably a change, but does it deserve a new version? Uh, if the API is, is, is mostly behaving in the same way, why in the world would you create a new version selector? Uh, and so, you know, users are generally not interested in minor changes. If you're not breaking my workflow, especially in APIs, I don't, I don't, I, I don't need to know that. Actually, I don't even wanna know that you changed something in that regards. If I find out through documentation, that's good, or you send me a newsletter, fine. But in terms of the programmatic side, it should stay the same. We don't, we don't care about it at all. Uh, if the behavior change, then it's a breaking change in that case, regardless of the model and whatsoever. I'm gonna go even further. I, I think Semver, which is usually the, the, the system you're using, I think it's broken. We should not be using that, not, not just for APIs, for everything. I'm not gonna go into detail, but the idea, I'm, and I can talk a little bit more probably offline, but Semver is broken because in general, if you're making a bug fix, I don't care. 
If you're making a new feature, I don't care. If you're, making a, if, you're, if you're incrementing the major version, that's where the problems start because you're not even telling me you're screwed. You're telling me you might be screwed, which is even worse because it means I gotta figure that out what is changing, how's that changing, at the incremental of the number is not gonna tell me any information. So I think try to not version at all, uh, and if you really have to, I don't think number is a good idea. And for anybody of you that is telling, hey, not versioning an API is very hard, uh, Microsoft Graph is the proof that it's possible. Microsoft Graph has only one version, 1.0, and it's gonna stay there forever. And believe me, the criteria that we use to say something is breaking or not are way more strict than you think they might be. And we still manage somehow. Sure, we pay the consequences, it has a cost, but it is possible. Um, so if somebody's pushing back on that, you can point at a graph, and we're trying to do that job as, as, as best as we can. We have a better version of the API where we do reserve the right to change the things anytime we want, but when we reach production, we don't touch it. Was a bad design, was a bad design, we stick with it. Uh, we have a deprecation process, but that's a different situation. So, and again, I think, uh, I think this is the reason why everybody's gonna agree with it, hopefully. Uh, then let's go with consistency, uh, which is another hopefully not controversial topic. And this is a real example that I've been seeing. So we have an API that you, know, you try to get a file to a hash, and if everything goes okay, you, know, you get file back, the test file.zip. If, he, if for some reason the file is not present in the platform, the, the people building this API decided to return a zip file with inside a JSON file telling you the file is not present. And I was arguing, you know, what, this is, an, why are you doing that, you know, and I, why in the world would you create a zip file with a JSON file inside telling me the file is not present and the argument that they told me it's for consistency reason because people are expecting a file all the time and we wanna always return a file even if it's not present and 404 actually makes sense. You know, now we use 404 for a lot of stuff but 404 used to be when you don't find the resource you're looking for and so I don't know why you're, you're kind of reinventing the wheel. And so, I mean, in general, you know, Check the HTTP status code can represent your condition. And in this specific case, you know, having consistency is good, but being consistently wrong is not good at all. You know, it's like, hey, I'm, I'm making a mistake, I wanna be consistent, and, and I'm gonna keep making the mistake even though everybody agrees that it's not a good idea. Um, and to keep going on that, um, this, is another, this is another example where essentially, uh, you know, you can probably go through that real quickly, and I can rather, cannot really hear for here, but essentially, uh, there are some cases where people decided to return a 200 and then a 404, and I was essentially asking, hey, I struggle to understand the logic. Why in some cases you're returning 200 and some cases you're returning 404 for a very similar resources? And so I was asking, you know, maybe I'm the stupid guy here. I don't understand what's going on. And they responded, hey, this is the update from the engineering team. Uh, the version V1 of the API, when you do this, it's a 404. But in this other API, which is so similar anyway, we're gonna return 200 when, when the sample is not found. And I don't even know what to tell you. And so, you know what I did? Uh, well, we'll update the code accordingly. Uh, and the long story short, we ended up essentially, with the busing of the time, creating a, a D crazy layer that will transform this, this weird situation into something we, that we could use reliably. Uh, and so, in general, the rules, you know, status quo are your friends. Take a look, take, take the, the time to take a look what they mean, um, and then, Although I'm not a fan of, of dictating how you should do the things, I think error messages and error format are one of, the, one of the places where it should be done because it really helps from a consumer perspective and that shows um, in the long term. Uh, the next one we're gonna be looking at, I don't know if we'll be able to see, um, can you guys read it or no? Okay, yeah, no, that's okay. Normally I don't do that, you know, th that's on purpose. But those guys should be ashamed and say, you know what, we're gonna be doing that anyway. And that's okay. Maybe we're not gonna be looking at all of the examples, but some of them, you know, they're probably worth. Uh, 
and so just to also give you an idea how the conversation goes in, this, uh, in those situations. Uh, okay, this real, oh, it's gone. Uh, okay, it should be readable now. Okay, so this is me engaging with somebody. Hey, I'm responsible for the app in the Singularity Marketplace, which is a product I work on, and I'm trying to understand what kind of response you're returning because uh, I get an idea of what it looks like, but there is no documentation. I don't know what the keys means. I'm not a security expert. I happen to work for a security company. I don't really know what that means. And so, you know, I was asking for uh, some clarification on the matter, and, you know, they were, they were kind enough. You know, hey, I'm, I'm redirecting you for the best person to uh, get your questions. He's on vacation, but he's going to be back. That's okay. And then he comes from vacation, and it's like, I'm afraid we don't have any documentation I can, I can share with you. You know, we can have a video call and I can tell you. Uh, but in general, we support bad with compatibility and so deprecated keys will not be removed. That's a good thing. And only new keys can be add, which is also a good thing. But we should make sure the connector relies on the right ones. So you're telling me essentially that the old keys probably are not even valid anymore. And at the end of the day, they were, they were returning empty strings. That was the way to keep compatibility and forcing you to move to the new payload. And so that, that, that was one of the examples that were happening. Uh, of course, I was not really happy with it. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at another one. Uh, yeah, this one is probably a good one too. All right. Start from the bottom. Okay, so the, my email starts at the bottom, and I'm, hey, a quick question. I'm trying to understand how the response looks like, because again, why would you write documentation? You, know, you, you claim to be API first, but you don't do that. And so I got a rough idea how the payload looks like and how the situation is gonna be working, but I don't even know what the fields look like. And so, I mean, I guess what the response means, you know, you, you just go on our auto-generated thing and you use the token and you, you know, you click on stuff and we can jump on a call this week if you want and I'm gonna be walking through, um, you, we're gonna be walking through the situation. And so that's another example of we, we don't have documentation, we don't really care, but if you really want to, uh, we can go through a call together that, that is not, that is not gonna be a problem. Um, okay, I'm gonna look at the last one, otherwise we're gonna losing too much time. Okay, this one is also, that's another one here. And I lost my mouse, okay. That's another situation where, hey, you're claiming of using this specific functionality. I don't even know, know what it is, and I'm saying, hey, is it on purpose? Is that a mistake? Am I using an undocumented feature? No, it's not in the API docs. We, we, we're not able even to document it, and it's not for general use, and it was specifically made for an integration like this. Uh, you can count on it staying. You know, that's a promise. I have an email, so I guess that's true. Uh, I'll try to get it on the API docs soon. Okay, I think you're getting the gist of the situation that we are at, and so we can go back to the slides. Um, not out. Okay, so what are the rules? Okay, having a video call, it does not count as documentation. That's, that's clearly true, and again, I think everybody agrees on that. Uh, I would say don't claim to be API first if you're not even documenting what you have. Uh, Build your API for scenarios, not for customer needs. You can see that the guy, the last guy said, hey, we made this for this specific integration with you. Uh, hey, if somebody's giving you a million dollars check, I mean, just go for it, that's fine. But in general, again, long lived API programs, you don't do that. Otherwise, you're gonna be in a very corner, corner case situation. And again, if it's not documented, it doesn't exist. Um, and the last one, a name is usually not enough to qualify a property. Again, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm not a security expert. I happen to work in a security company, so when, not, when you're talking about a security indicator, what is that supposed to mean? And, and uh, so I think spending even 20 minutes having a glossary of, of the, the resources you're exposing through an API, it's gonna give a huge help. 
especially like for people like me that I was mostly brought in the company because of API experience and not security experience. Okay, the next one, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, and uh, you can take a look at this payload and maybe you have an idea what's going on, but essentially if you take a look here, the filter has a tag name contains, and then we go here and there's a created at, um, another one name contains, uh, you know, this kind of stuff. And essentially what happened is that this specific API has a query language in the body of a request that it's not gonna scale because hey, you know, when, what am I gonna do when I need another property? You know, are you gonna add another section in the payload? Are you gonna do that? Um, and so it's hard to scale, and more importantly, the problem has been solved. Like all data, for instance, that might help. It's a protocol designed for selecting and filtering on top of APIs, um, like HTTP APIs. Um, you can also use GraphQL, that is fine as well. I mean, I have my problems with GraphQL, but that's a, that's a different situation. And so, Doran went the wheel, and I honestly, in some cases, I don't understand, how did you get there? Like, if you Google five seconds search API, all data is the first result. And so, I, I struggle to understand why would you go in such a way. Uh, and the things can precipitate. I mean, check this out. They put Kubernetes-specific filters in an API, and so, in theory, I'm able to filter threat happening on a specific Kubernetes pod through the public API. This is a security concern as well. I'm filtering on somebody else's Kubernetes cluster. And I'm still wondering what happened. Um, I didn't ask though. All right, so that's the baseline. I, 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 I'm confident we all agree that this is not good stuff, hopefully. Um, and now we get to the debatable, where people, some people disagree with what's next, and that's fine, and I'm not gonna get too much irritated because I, I recognize that now it, opinions come into play. Okay, the first one is payload pollution. Um, let's take a look here uh, in this payload, and you can see that um, in this case, we have in the response a section for errors, a section for the pagination, and then we have the actual data. This is something that you know you probably see a lot of times. You know, you get error and pagination, um, and those are my rules in general. First of all, I do think. I mean, in this case, I know for sure, but it might be in other cases. This is a company mandated standards. I want to see the header here. I want to see the pagination, and I want to see then the data payload. And so, I think in those regards, uh, the company convention should be very loose. Uh, why in the world am I sending all this stuff that, that, that is not even, that, that this is not data, this is metadata. And HTTP has a place for metadata, which is headers. And so if you can think a little bit more, like pagination, that's fine to put in an HTTP header and through links you can signal the clients that there is more data to grab. And the same goes with errors. Um, and so, uh, in this case, a, a wrong company standard is setting up the API for a failure. Not a failure in an economical terms, but um, I, d I don't think this is gonna be okay in five years and 10 years when other stuff is going to take. And so spend some time to understand what is data and what is metadata, and then you go from there. On that side, I will say, personally speaking, I don't think we're doing a great job either, in particular Microsoft Graph, because of our data, we have a specific field in the payload signaling the presence of a next link. So, I mean, you, I mean, again, we're not doing a great job either. On the other hand, I'm gonna get credit anyway because GitHub is doing that correctly and we bought GitHub. I never worked on GitHub, uh, but we, somebody's doing it right within Microsoft. Uh, and so in my opinion, and again, it's fine to disagree, I think using links as HTTP headers, it's the right way. Data is data, metadata is metadata. Uh, so that's the first one. Uh, the next one that, I, that we're gonna be taking a look at is namespace properties. Um, I'm gonna give you one hint and then five seconds to think about what is wrong and then I'll show you. So we have this property, that's where the problem starts. All right, so the problem I see here, in my opinion, um, is if we're calling this thing BGP properties, 
why is the inner property called BGP ASN? We already know what the context is because the containing map is called BGP properties. And so I would argue this is a better system where essentially the context is coming from the map containing the data. Uh, and this happens, I, I do see this happening a lot of times actually. Again, I don't think it's, gonna, it's, a, it's a showstopper, but I do believe um, you know, the context matters in the specific case and in general. And one of the ways that I suggest to see what the situation is, try to think about a JSON path to get to, get, to, get to that specific properties and that, that's gonna give you a good understanding about how, if you're doing too much namespacing. Um, again, it's fine if you disagree, but I do think that the, the, the system on the right, it, it's arguably better. Uh, the next one, the wrong terminology. I, I have very little room for disagreement, but in general, we have to be a little bit more precise with our speech. Those are some of the quotes that I've been reading about. You know, all day there's a protocol to create a REST API. That is not true. Uh, we have navigation property, so it's REST. That is not true. RESTful is a graph of entity. That is not true. And this makes the API more RESTful. Those are all, in my opinion, it, they're out of context, but they're all inaccurate representation of what the paradigm is, what are the constraints that they want you in the system, and in general, I will you know, read the actual document instead of the blog post. And I had a presentation back in the time where I've been going a little bit more deeply about what REST is all about, but the original document, don't even believe me, read the actual document, and then you can go from there. Um, and in general, the rules that I would suggest well, first of all, and I, and I told you, you know, read the actual document, not the blog post. Um, also, you know, that, that's an advice for life. I would say be precise in your speech. Like CI and CD, they are two different things. Um, REST is a specific set of architectural constraints. Don't say Agile, Scrum, Sprint, if you don't even know what that means. Uh, this is an actual quote that I found, and and. I don't know what that means, right? I, I just don't understand it. Um, and my point is, maybe people will not speak up, but people will not forget what you've been saying and the inaccuracy. I'm now gonna forget, for sure. And I have my list of people, when, when they speak, they, they inflated the value of their words, and like, yeah, yeah, whatever you say, that's nothing. That's not what Anyway, uh, let's move on. Errors, I, I, I don't really have that much to say here. Um, and that's just a derivation of other rules we've been talking about. So use the correct status code whenever it's possible. I mean, this, this is just so weird. Like you do 200 and then you embed the code inside. Uh, I do think in this case it's mostly because of proxies that, you know, they rewrap your message, put in a 200 and then you send the status code outside. Sometimes it's just people don't know the HTTP spec. Uh, and this is a problem for proxies because they cache the response and, and it is not good. I, that's literally zero justification. I just don't understand why that would happen. And in general, uh, find the structure standards like the RFC 7807. I'm a big fan of it um, to send the error. Uh, don't just rely on random strings um, because, because uh, you know, if you build a machine first interface and then uh, a human interface on top, that it's way more scalable and it's gonna work. Uh, and in general, you know, enumerate all your errors, not regardless of the APIs. Um, that, that, that's that's going to give you arguably a better system in general. Okay, so we saw the common ground, and I think we all agree. We've seen the debatable where there's going to be some disagreement, I'm quite sure. And now the last level that I call philosophy because it's some of the things I've been thinking about. I don't know if that's the real idea. I don't have enough data. So it's some of the topics that I've been thinking about. Okay. This is coming from Microsoft Graph, um, and I'm gonna walk you very quickly through the scenario. Essentially, you have a risky user resource type, which is essentially, essentially a user that the platform deems uh, that there's something wrong for some reason. So it's a risky user, what do you wanna do with it? And you can see we have uh, confirmed the risky user as compromised and dismissed the risky user as a valid one. Um, and uh, that's the first part. And the second part, you can see some of the properties of the risk user. There is an ID, there's a bunch of other properties and whatsoever. 
And so my problem with this approach um, is, in general, uh, the confirmation of a risky user, in this case, has been modeled as an action. And by digging into, essentially, the team decided to just expose the function directly from the C-sharp project and whatsoever. And I would argue a more, a more interesting design of this specific situation would have been put a status on the user and you change the property through a patch request on the user, and the side effect of such a change is gonna trigger whatever has to be happening in the system. And so the general advice that I have, instead of thinking of actions directly on entities, try to see such an action as a change of status or drive that change through data manipulation, and then the side effect happens in the system. That thing is gonna lead to easier to test, easier to log, to replicate, and when you're just handling data instead of remote procedure call, you have way more freedom what you wanna do today and in the future. Um, and so, again, I'm not fully convinced. I do think it leads to a better system, but I, hopefully you understand what I'm saying. Instead of just exposing the RPC from your programming language directly to the web, Try to think about more a data-driven approach where you're changing properties and data and the side effect happens as a byproduct of the change in the data. The second thing that you can see, the risky user is an entity on his own. And so the other question that I was having, why is not this information in the user directly? Why do we need to have another entity just representing the risky user and then we link that to the original user? Um, well, it turns out that was a constraint with the, with the software we were using, where essentially we have a bunch of limits where we cannot add too many properties on, on, on the user entity anymore. That's not scaling. And so, in general, if your underlying framework or programming language is putting constraint on your real design, um, you might have a problem. We're having this problem in Microsoft. We pay the consequences of it. Um, and that's, that's a weird situation to be in because uh, there's a technical situation that it's not that easy to overcome and you know that it's gonna lead to not a good API design and this is one of the examples. They didn't do the function because they wanted to. They didn't have a choice. I, I don't think they thought about more data-driven approach at all, but even if they did, it wouldn't have worked. And so someone that yes, that I want to see Microsoft, that's just not gonna happen because of technical problems. Um, and, you know, as a um, recap from what we see before, you know, it's a good if the API exposes entities' resources and you allow data manipulation to the user and the side effect happened because somebody manipulated the data. So prefer a patch method if you can. Uh, prefer a new entity. Instead of having a pay endpoint, ask the user to create a payment request and then you return the response. Uh, so data-driven data has won over the wire. That is inarguably true, and so the more you stick to that mantra, I think the more in the long term your API successful is going to be. Another one that is a little bit controversial, I do believe in general that language that has structural types or are untyped at all are more flexible, especially on large APIs. Um, I can give you one example. You know, Microsoft is a .NET shop forever, and .NET is primarily um, nominal types. That is having a lot of implication in the way we do API design, and I do wish we would have a different, different tools in some cases. And so, if you're thinking about the large API strategy, TypeScript is a good choice. Uh, in general, structural type or untyped languages, in my experience, they prove to be better. Okay, we're getting close to the end. Um, all data might not be what you need, um, and so I was advoca advoca advocating for all data at the beginning in, in case of select and whatsoever, but um, if we, just to give you an idea, take a look at those bunch of endpoints. Uh, you know, we have API user and say we're selecting name and surname, age and email, then we're selecting the first five, and then we're ordering by the name and the XML, and I don't really have a standard model yet, but the point that I have against all data in this case this is the same resource. The first one and the third one, then the second one, they're the same resource, and I'm just selecting different fields. And most of the time, it's because I want a smaller payload, and so it's faster. 
I think it's a false myth um, because I think caching works. And so it is way faster to return a cache response with four fields rather than do two requests, process them completely, serialize and deserialize to save a bunch of fields. And so I guess my point is if your aim is to save bytes uh, and be fast, you're using the wrong protocol. There's better alternatives uh, if performance really matters to you. And so that's the measurement you want to take. I think GraphQL is not going to save you at all. Um, I think it caused way more harms than good um, in this case. And in general, there is a bunch of work that the client can do. Uh, like you, you can order the stuff on the client if you want. Uh, instead of hosting format, you, you can use HTTP content negotiation. And so, I mean, all data is done good and it's done bad. I'm not a big fan of it. But in general, uh, you may, you may want to um, be careful on, on what you're looking for here. Uh, the last one, it's a little bit, uh, this is a situation we have been in Microsoft, like implicit promises. And I'm going to be using an example from Twitter. If you cannot read it, I'll do that for you. You don't have to do that. Essentially, they're saying, hey, uh, by default, we use a pagination system, and we're going to be returning 30 days of data in the first page, in the first API call, and then you can move on to the next page and the next page. And even though you don't, probably you don't realize it the first, at the first sight, uh, that is a very strong promise. Um, and we, Microsoft, believe that this is a breaking change. If for some reason we want to return 15 days in the first page, that is a breaking change. And so, in general, uh, try not to make promises that you cannot keep in the future. Uh, and um, actually, I would argue, try to be very scrooge with the kind of strong commitment. Um, in this specific case, to see if, if a change will be a breaking change, try to think about this requirement as a query string parameter. And in this case, there is a correlation. When I'm telling you I'm going to be returning the first 30 days of data by default, you're essentially making an implicit query string parameter with a from and to. And if that thing change, the data set change, that is a breaking change. And so if you can formalize those kind of implicit promises into query string parameters or any technical situation, well, that is something that if you change, you're breaking it. Uh, and I think the metadata in this case can help, you know, you have the cake and eat it too. Because for in this specific case, a non-breaking approach would have been, hey, how much data I'm returning you? It's in an HTTP header in the metadata section. And so you use that as your source of the truth. And so I can change it, and your API is not going to break, because it's not a hard code commitment. Mm. There will be a lot of other topics and, and stuff that I've been seeing, but I want to stay keep on the time. So uh, unless you, if you have a bunch of questions, I'm happy to answer, and then I have some other closing remarks as a, as a way to move forward. Yeah, do we have a question about all these topics? Yeah, we have one question. I don't know if you've seen this XKCD drawing where you say every, every change is a breaking change for someone's workflow. Did you see that? Uh, like well, even I, I, I would say Microsoft, the, the policy is very strict. Like, it's very easy to consider something as a breaking change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but in the drawing they say, you know, like, uh, they stop because the CPU is overheating when you touch the space bar too much, like, so they, they, up, they made a patch and say, oh, no, I was actually piloting all my, you know, heat, uh, uh, like, at home with the space bar, and, you know, like, every breaking change changes someone's workflow. Every change breaks someone's workflow at the end, right? Yeah, and well, I can tell you, I'm going to quote Torvalds here, if you have a bug and people are relying on that bug, <laughs> that's a feature. And I kid you not, um, yeah. Java is doing this approach, and they have a wonderful compatibility story. People are going to cry about it, but... Yeah, I love it. If your bug, if people rely on your bug, it's not a bug, it's a feature. It's a feature. Yeah. Yeah, there were a couple of times you were negative on GraphQL. Could you clarify why you're negative on GraphQL? Oh, come again, sorry? Uh, you were you you were negative on GraphQL a couple times. Can yeah. you clarify why you're negative on GraphQL? Yeah. Oh, okay. So we have an extra day of conference that just came out <laughs> because the answer to the question can take a long time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna give you just my my top two. I have I have a bunch of problem with it. Um, actually, I, I, okay, I'll give you three. The first one is uh, I've seen 
I think there's a very good evidence that the use case for GraphQL, most of the people, is save, save bytes and optimize bandwidth. And again, I think if that's really what you're going for, I think you have a different problem. You should change your protocol. Uh, what you're getting instead is, and I have personal experience, people are mostly connecting the GraphQL source directly through the database, and that becomes a nightmare when you're changing even a single field. Uh, there's also the problem that because you're making a direct connection, most of the logic of the app starts to shift to the front end, and that is becoming a problem when you have a different client. So if you're owning the client and the server and nobody else is gonna use it, I think you have a point in using it. If you're, if you're sending a long API strategy, unless you're very, very, very careful and you care about discoverability, which I think was the original point of GraphQL because the schema can be queried ahead of the time, I don't think you have a, I don't think you have a good use case for GraphQL. Um, and the third one, I'm not gonna lie about it, uh, I've seen in my experience that a good chunk of the GraphQL use, users are Twitter emoji-driven developers, and that's, that, 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 that has consequences in the kind of system we have. I'm not saying it's the totality, but I think that it's a substantial amount of people. And, um, and again, that leads to systems that are not built to last long, like five, 10, and 15 years. My, we have been having conversation about having GraphQL in Microsoft Graph, and we decided that it's not, that it's not going to happen, um, especially for those problems. Like, the compatibility story and the um, renaming of fields, um, and that, that would be way more. Those are my very, very quick takeaway. I'm happy to talk offline over an email if you want, but, uh, um, but that's the gist of it. And you're actually quite nice by email because when people have answered you on support, you were like, okay, this is how you do it. Like, you could uh, have shamed them. Like, this is how you do things, really? Like, we're in 22, right, or whatever, 2018. Or I quit that job. <laughs> so that's that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a last question before your last remarks, or? Yeah, I just, uh, okay. Uh, in case, um, like, if you want, really want to learn how to design APIs, and not from a technical standpoint, like, I want to use Open API or whatsoever, but I want to understand what is the mental model to set up a system that is going to last 15 years from the beginning down to the API, uh, I take a look at Clojure. Uh, it's, a J, it's a Lisp that runs on the JVM, and the way the language makes you think about data structure and data manipulation and side effect is built such in a way that it's gonna automatically propagate into an API that it's gonna last. Clojure is a, is a language to build system that last. And so if, you, if that's what you're looking for, I'm not saying use the language, Take a look at the key principles and write a small program. That's going to change the way about thinking of software anyway, and the API is going to be a consequence. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's the gist of the talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Vincendo. Thank you.